privilege to open up God's word with his people. Uh, I've just written greetings from Emmanuel Church, which uh, congregation will be meeting now uh, in Northway Secondary College. Uh, we're here family service, um, and so it's great that we are able to have fellowship together. Able to worship God in different places, but as one, one family of Christ. Uh, as we sang that song, I hope you have felt a sense of needing God's help as we come to a passage like this. Uh, you may have wondered, what, why did I choose this passage? Well, partly because uh, at the induction service for Pastor Bob, the theme of Elijah passing the cloak to Elisha was a big part of it, and this is the next passage. This is the next section. What happens next? That could be interesting. I, I also like tackling tough passages. <laughs> Uh, because I just imagine you're having your morning quiet time with your Bible and you read about two bears coming and mauling 42 boys <laughs> and it makes you wonder, what does that have to do with Jesus? Is this a superpower you get when you go bold? It's like God's compensation <laughs> for losing your hair. More seriously, is Richard Dawkins right to say that the God of the Old Testament is a bad-tempered, bloodthirsty God who has nothing to do with Jesus? That's a sort of question which is, rising up in at least some of your minds as you read this passage. And you see that the reason this is a problem for us is that the, the risen Jesus doesn't say, now that I've risen from the dead, just been the Old Testament. The risen Lord Jesus uh, says to his disciples, can we have the next slide, please? Uh, that everything in the Old Testament, the law and the prophets, uh, so that's Luke 24, 27, if you can't read it, because I didn't quite get the size of your screens right, but... Jesus says everything in Moses and all the prophets is all about him. It's all about Jesus. So we're going to have to do some work, more work than you might have to do if I'd chosen a nice uh, gospel passage that sort of flows more easily. But at the end of it, we're going to, we are going to hear God's word to us, and it will be a good word for us, even with the bears. So the first step we're going to take, the first bit uh, of, of our time, is thinking about who is Elisha? Uh, now, if you're here at the induction service, you'll know Elisha has just taken over as Israel's prophet from Elijah. And you might get confused between those two characters. Elijah, Yahweh is my God. Elisha, God saves. So sometimes just remembering the slightly different meaning. Elijah, Yahweh is my God. And he is the greatest action prophet of the Old Testament. You know, there are lots of other prophets who write things down. Elijah doesn't do that. But in the long history of Israel and the Promised Land... Elijah is the greatest prophet who brings God's message to the people in such a powerful and dramatic way. He declares that because of Israel's sin and King Ahab leading them to worship Baal, there will be a drought. And for three years, there is no rain. The God of thunderstorms, that's Baal, is exposed as powerless against Yahweh, the creator of the world. And then Elijah, I'm sure you know the story, most of you, he challenges the prophets of Baal to a contest. Who's the real God? The prophets of Baal, hundreds of them, call down fire from heaven from Baal, but no fire comes. Elijah soaks his offering with water before praying and saying, God, Yahweh, show yourself to be the real God. And fire comes down from heaven, proving before all Israel that Yahweh is the real God. And so Elijah is the mighty prophet in the northern part of Israel. They've sort of split the kingdom, and he's in the northern bit. And as we come to 2 Kings 2, he gets carried away. Elijah gets carried up to heaven in a fiery chariot and a whirlwind. And there's a problem. You see, despite his mighty acts, Israel has not turned back to God. It's not abandoned its idols. Someone else is going to need to continue the work. Someone else needs to finish the job. And that someone is Elisha. Picks up Elijah's coat. He parts the Jordan River, just like Elijah had done on the way. And he shows that the Spirit of God now rests on him, for him to be God's messenger in Israel. So uh, if we have that, the next slide, next table, we're going to see that there is, there is a pattern emerging that will help us to get the connections that we need to make sense of, of the bears and the water. So Elijah is the, the mighty prophet. His success is called Elisha. The handover happens at the Jordan River. What is parted, the Jordan River gets divided, and what is given to the success of the Holy Spirit comes on Elisha. Now, I like to make people discuss and do some of the work for me, so I'm going to give you one minute to have a quick discussion with someone around you. And what I really, really want you to think about in this time is what other great character before Elijah hands over his ministry at the River Jordan? And can you remember any other similarities with the Elisha story? 
They take a minute, uh, and if you don't know your Bible very well, feel free to just chat about how weird this is all is. That's fine as well. I suspect you're a sort of congregation where getting you back is harder than getting you to get going. So um, let me call you back and uh, just see. First of all, shout out. Uh, anyone should feel free to shout out. What, what is the great character before Elijah who hands over his ministry at the River Jordan? Feel free to shout out. Moses. Moses. Yes, on the edge of the promised land. Uh, and so now let's just uh, think a bit more. What, what is Moses known for? What are some of the big things Moses is known for? The Exodus and Ten Commandments, the law. The Exodus and the, and the law, yep. Um, and what's his successor called? Joshua. Anyone know what that means? Yahweh saves. The Lord saves. So Elisha, God saves. Yahweh, Joshua, Yahweh saves. They hand over at the Jordan River. What is parted at this handover, or in, near to this handover? The Jordan River. Joshua, Moses parts the Red Sea. Joshua, parts of the Jordan River. And you can also find, um, if you click on this next slide now, in Deuteronomy 34, 9, uh, Joshua also gets the Spirit of God put on him as he starts leading the people. So we have the two greatest figures of the Old Testament, Moses and Elijah, missions completed by a man who follows after called something like God Saves. And the handover happens at the Jordan, and the Holy Spirit is given to the new man. Can anyone see how this points us to Jesus? Anyone want to shout out one or two ways this points us to Jesus? John the Baptist, John the Baptist absolutely, is the great figure, and Jesus comes. So let's just, I'm, just, I'm not going to patronise you by going through all of this. Let me just run through this really quickly. John the Baptist comes. He's the Elijah figure wearing those camel hair clothes with a belt out in the wilderness. And Jesus comes to him. Jesus means the Lord saves. It would have been Yeshua at the time. And then the, Gr the Greek version is Jesus. Um, the Lord saves, comes to him. And we see that God has been preparing the way. Because the law and the prophets could never transform people. But now the Lord saves has turned up. God in the flesh has turned up to finish the job. To really bring, bring people into God's rest. To really bring people back to worship of the true God and life. And so the way is prepared by the Elijah figure, by John the Baptist. And Jesus is baptised at the Jordan. But it's not the Jordan River that splits. What splits at Jesus' baptism? The heavens split. And the Holy Spirit comes on him in a unique way, a fuller way than even on Moses and Elijah. Because here is the ultimate anointed one. Here is the Christ. Here is the one who can really transform people and bring them to be God's people forever. And so to this question, who is Elisha? The answer is, he is a pattern of Jesus as the messenger of God. His ministry as God's messenger displays in advance what the Christ is going to do. And so the first two cities he visits, the towns he visits, are pictures that are meant to work together to show us what Jesus' ministry is going to be like. You may still be thinking, the bears confuse me. That's okay, we're going to get to it. But we're going to start with the easier one. We're going to start with Jericho. Jericho and Bethel are deliberately being put next to each other because they're kind of opposites. And so Elisha, as the pattern of Jesus, as the, the messenger of God, comes. And what do we see? First of all, let's look at, at Jericho. That's 2 Kings 2, verse 18. We know he's staring in Jericho, and the people of the city come to him. 
And Jericho is a city of curse. Practically, this is expressed in bad water and the land being unproductive, verse 19. Now, in a semi-arid setting, water is very obviously life. Um, it doesn't quite so much apply in England, and even less so if you're in Wales or Ireland, where rain is just the default. But <laughs> if you're in the desert, if you're in a place where rain only comes periodically, uh, the water supply is, is key. And Jericho has bad water. It, it, the, the, land, the idea, I think, is, is the idea of it causes miscarriages, it causes sickness, it, it doesn't make the land fertile. Something has gone wrong in Jericho. And that something is linked, to, it, it's not just a random natural disaster, it's, that something is linked to covenant unfaithfulness. You see, before the people entered the promised land, Moses said there will be blessings for covenant loyalty and curses for covenant unfaithfulness turning away from God to idols. And the northern kingdom has been turning away from the worship of the true God to worship idols and to worship Baal. And so now they are experiencing God's covenant curse. So to give just one example, in Deuteronomy 28 and verse 18, it speaks of the fruit of your womb will be cursed and the crops of your land and the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks. And that's what they're experiencing in Jericho, that they have turned away from the true and living God and now they're experiencing God's covenant curse. They have not been devoted to the true God of Israel, the creator of the world. And it actually gets worse, because Jericho isn't just one example among all the others of the northern kingdom. They're like the epitome of getting it wrong. When Joshua took Jericho in Joshua 6 at the end, he commands that the city is never to be rebuilt. And he declares a curse. Curse before the Lord is the one who undertakes to rebuild the city Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn son, he will lay its foundations. At the cost of his youngest, he will set up its gates. And so it's a sign of how bad Israel has become that in the time of King Ahab, in the time of Elijah, Jericho is rebuilt. And it's against this background of, of curse that the people of Jericho come to Elisha, and it might seem hopeless. It's a bit like um, if you've told your children not to go into a space because it's dangerous. And they've gone in and they've got hurt. And they've got this moment of, do I go to mum and dad for comfort or do I try and deal with it myself because I'm afraid I'm going to get told off? It's a bit like that. Surely Elisha, God's messenger, is going to say, you shouldn't be living here. Why are you whining about it? Go somewhere else. You made your bed, sleep in it. They, 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 they are aware that God is more gracious than even we human beings are. They're, they're aware that there's hope, even though they've messed it up totally. They're living in the wrong place. They're under God's curse. They've been worshipping idols, but they come to God's messenger. And as they do so, we see the beauty of Elisha as a Christ picture, because he responds with the compassion and power of Christ to bless people living under God's curse. Verse 20, bring me a new bowl, he said, and put salt in it. So they brought it to him, and he went out to the spring and threw the salt into it, saying, This is what the Lord says. I have healed the water. Never again will I cause death, will it cause death, or make the land unproductive. And the water has remained pure to this day, according to the word Elisha had spoken. Do you feel the compassion of God through this? The compassion of Jesus. These desperate people who had turned away from God, who'd worshipped idols, who were living in a city that God had expressly forbidden them to live in, but when they come and ask God's messenger for help, he doesn't rebuke them. He doesn't say, sort your lives out and then I'll consider it. He acts in grace and kindness. He purifies the water by the word of the Lord, a lasting healing, an everlasting living water. Friends, do you see the pattern of Jesus here? Throughout his ministry, he was, it was the poor and the outcast, the cursed and the sinners who came to him. They recognized this man as bringing God's compassion and God's power. And so they came, seeking God's blessing in their misery. And Jesus welcomed them. He ate with them. He forgave them. He healed them. That Samaritan woman who was ethnically and religiously an outsider, whose marriages pointed to frustration of life and quite likely sexual immorality, she was offered living water by Jesus, who knew her and spoke with her. Jesus offers living water that never dries up and gives it everlasting life. He offers the Holy Spirit to a woman who was an outsider, rejected and scorned. And all the outcasts and sinners of Jesus' day did, 
as the people of Jericho did in our passage, all they had done was come to Jesus, come to God's messenger in faith, welcomed and trusted him. The thing the people of Jericho do is they recognize Elisha is to be respected as God's messenger. They, they describe him, don't they, in verse 19, look our Lord. That, that word Lord is kind of a flexible word, it's like sir in English. It could mean someone who's actually noble, or it could just mean we're being respectful to you. But the key point is they're respectful to the man who God has appointed to be his messenger. They honor Elisha as God's messenger. They listen to his words as God's words. They're expectant of God's blessing through him. And as they present their need to Elisha, they know he has power to heal and cleanse. They hope for the compassion of God, and they're not disappointed. People under God's curse are blessed when they welcome God's messenger. And that might be the message you need to hear this morning. Perhaps you came here feeling ashamed, under God's curse in some way, an outsider. And while you hope God will have mercy, deep down, you feel so damaged and polluted that you're sure God will walk by. You feel so guilty that you feel sure God will not forgive you. But here in the heart of the Old Testament, we find Jesus displayed. We find that character and power that will touch the leper and eat with the tax collector. His compassion and power are clearly displayed for us here. He is willing to come and heal and cleanse and bless. He needs only to say the word and it will happen. So the only question is with us. It's not with Jesus, it's with us. Will we welcome Jesus in? Will we welcome him as God's messenger, the king, the word of God? Will we let him be in charge of us? Or if we will... Then he comes and lives in us. He gives us the life-giving water, the Holy Spirit. Elisha's ministry in Jericho, his first ministry, displays the compassion of Jesus for the outcast and the cursed, his power to cleanse and bless, his heart. And the only requirement is to welcome Jesus as God's messenger, as the Lord who reigns and saves. And if we could stop there, that would be a lovely comforting message, but there are two cities in 2 Kings 2. And the second is the warning, God's warning to us. So we must move to Bethel, not you, um, <laughs> but to the ancient city of Bethel in Israel. So Jericho was cursed. Bethel, as I'm sure you're aware, given your name, uh, was blessed. But the very name means house of God, Bethel. They can trace their city back to the great patriarch, Jacob, whose name is also Israel. Jacob met God here in a dream, declaring in Genesis 28 and verse 17, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. It's a great start. And the site continues to be one of the foremost religious sites in Israel. And what had happened is they continued to be religious, but it had begun to go wrong. And I want to say very clearly, I didn't choose this passage in any prophetic sense about you as a church. Okay? I chose it because it carried on from the passage before. But Bethel in Israel at this time has, despite a brilliant start, gone wrong. It has become the center of idolatry in the northern kingdom of Israel. And the way it worked was, we continue to worship Yahweh, but we've put up some golden calves, some golden statues, so that people won't go down to Jerusalem to worship. That's what uh, Jeroboam does straight after the division of the kingdom. Explicitly forbidden in the second of the Ten Commandments, but here it is, worshipping Yahweh with idols. And so they're very religious. They say, we've got Yahweh on our side. We've even got Yahweh, in a sense, in a box. Look, we've got him. Statue of him's here. And they thought they had God on their side, and they were very proud of their heritage. And now the lads of Bethel go out, verse 22. From there, Elisha went up to Bethel, as he was walking along the road, some boys came out of the town and jeered at him. Get out of here, Baldy, or get up from here, Baldhead. Uh, I think the old NIV says, get out of here, Baldy. Now, the word boys has a range of meanings. It could be anything from, you know, the two-year-old to the, the young adults, you know. And, uh, you know, my granddad used to call women of 60 girls. So I think, you know, we know how words have a, a range of meanings. But if... Well, we, context gives us a certain amount of information. You don't let 42 toddlers wander off out the city together with no adult supervision. Yeah? Even in the ancient world, they didn't do that. Uh, if, there are, if there's a group of over 40 lads wandering off, then I think teenage years is probably the reasonable ballpark. 
And what's happening here is that the, the young men, the boys of the town, have absorbed the attitude of their parents, and they go out from the city and they say, we don't need no prophet of God. We've got the golden calf. We don't want you, Elisha, following that old man Elijah's pattern and telling us we're getting it wrong and we need to abandon our idols. We want you to get lost. And so he, Elisha calls down a covenant curse. So it, it, it's not magic. What he, he's not doing magic. He's not doing a magic spell. He's turning around and calls down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. And two bears come out of the woods and maul 42 of the boys. And bizarre as that seems, that's not random. Because you remember covenant blessing, covenant curse? Back in Moses. Uh, he does it in two, there's two places. Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 are the two places where you find the, the covenant blessings and curses. In the, 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 in the Leviticus version of the curse, you read this. Leviticus 26, verse 21. If you remain hostile toward me and refuse to listen to me, I will multiply your affliction seven times over as your sins deserve. I will send wild animals against you and they will rob you of your children, destroy your cattle and make you so few in number that your roads will be deserted. And so here is the warning. If you shut out God's messenger, no amount of religion will save you from God's curse. Bethel shuts out and disrespects God's messenger, and so covenant curse falls on them. The bears maul the lads, the children of Bethel. And that's an uncomfortable truth which carries on as we look at Jesus' ministry as well. Religious people are cursed if they reject God's messenger. You see, the pattern of Elijah is not just for the Jericho effect, the blessing for cursed people who welcome God's messenger. It's also seen in the Bethel effect that the religious people who reject God's messenger will face God's curse. Because who was it who most hated Jesus? It was the religious people, wasn't it? The ones who got him executed were the Jewish religious leaders. We've got God sorted. We don't want God himself turning up and telling us what he's like and how we should follow him. And so Jesus warns of curse for rejecting him. He sometimes uses the language of how. Uh, but let me just give you a few examples to show that I'm not making this up. Jesus does this warning. John 3, verse 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Oh, great. We love John 3, 16, don't we? But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. Or in the woes on the religious leaders in Matthew 23, Jesus says... You testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Go ahead then and complete what your ancestors started. You snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? This is sobering, isn't it? But we need to be clear. Those who reject Jesus as God's messenger and king stand in terrible danger. Because in rejecting Jesus, they're rejecting God, and they put themselves outside of God's blessing and under God's curse. And so this is actually a warning, first of all, for those of us in church, for the religious people. The very religious, the self-righteous, can shut out God's word, God's messenger, God's king, in such a way that God curses us rather than blesses us. And that's a danger for all of us. It's not just a danger. I, I, you know, I'm a Baptist, so I, I find it easy to, to go, all those people who wear robes and have incense, uh, you know, that's the external religion. They, they put external religion. No, 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 this is a warning for us as well. You know, actually, our guitars and our PowerPoints and our coffee after the service can also become the external practices of religion while we stop Jesus being Lord of our lives and we won't listen to his word when it challenges our hearts. Do we shut God's word? Do we only read the bits we like and so ignore God's voice when it challenges how we, challenges how we live or worship? This is the, the warning that echoes through the centuries. Religious people are cursed when they reject God's messenger. Do not reject Jesus. Do not silence his voice. Do not shut out his presence. Don't let a hard veneer of religious activity stop you from being transformed internally by Jesus now, this also extends out beyond the church, though, because actually everyone is religious. 
They're just religious about different things. Uh, it might be that they're religious about their sport, or their home improvement, or their conservation work, or something else. What they're religious about might not be look like coming to church. But we are homo religio. We are religious people. We worship something. We have something as our highest value, something as our greatest security. In the ancient world, it might be the sea god, or the goddess of fertility, or a corn god, or a war god. And now religion might be money or fame or pleasure. It might be the religions of environmentalism and campaigning for rights. Uh, not that those are bad things, but they become people's moral standing and their guiding star in life. And if any of those things become their prime thing so that they shut Jesus out, then they are in danger. Our very prosperity here in the UK and actually our sense of moral purpose and goodness for very many of our fellow citizens is the danger here. We forget that we're needy and guilty. Because only those who humbly admit they're in the wrong, only those who say, actually, we're more like Jericho, can welcome in God's king. Those who think we've achieved it are in terrible danger. <coughs> we've had to work fairly hard to get the message of Jesus out of our passage this morning. I hope it's been worth it. We've seen that this story tells us all about Jesus. We've seen God's heart of compassion for people who know they're guilty and cursed and come to Jesus as king, as God's messenger for help. And so if you feel crushed by life, if you feel inadequate and ashamed, Jesus is for you. Come to him and receive him and his blessing. And we've also been warned that religious people who reject Jesus as God's king and final word will face the reality of God's curse. Uh, maybe that warning is for some of us here today, a jolt, a reminder, that actually I shouldn't be playing the religious game, but welcoming Jesus in. No past experience, past religiosity will save you if you today shut Jesus out. You need to let Jesus in. Let Jesus rule. Let his word set your life. Let God's blessing flow in. It's just we just take a moment of quiet by ourselves, and then I'll pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much that the way to eternal life is by receiving your mercy and welcoming you in. Thank you that we don't have to achieve it because we couldn't achieve it. Thank you that it doesn't matter how rubbish our past is, it doesn't matter how weak and stained we feel right now. You are the compassionate and gracious God who welcomes us with open arms. And we pray where, where we have put up barriers of religiosity and hardened our heart against letting you reign in our hearts. That you, by your spirit, would overcome our own resistance to you and enable us to come to you for your forgiveness. Thank you that no matter how long we've been going in the wrong path, the moment we turn to you, your forgiveness is there, your arms are open, and you welcome us in. Amen.